Good day and thank you for joining CivilNet. My guest today is Dr. Razmik Panosyan. He's the director of the Department of Army and Communities for the Galus Gulbenkian Foundation. Thank you for being here today. I know your schedule is very tight. And uh, Dr. Panosyan, in the most recent times, years, we've come to know the, Galus, the Army and Communities Department of the Galus Gulbenkian Foundation as uh, the foundation that's preserving the Armenian, Western Armenian language, that's working towards its preservation. And uh, I've been to the website, preservation mm -hmm. is, the word is used, but however, hearing you last week, you made it clear that it's not a matter of preservation, it's a matter of reinvigoration. Yeah. Uh, I mean, could you tell us a little bit more about the programs and also I mean, your concept of how things should be? Yes, by all means. Uh, first of all, I should say that, uh, yes, we, the revitalization, and that's the word we use, the revitalization of Armenian language. We also use preservation, so uh, we don't see a huge, huge problem in using both. But the revitalization of the Armenian language, Western Armenian, that we focus on, uh, is something that is at the core of our five-year program that we have uh, prepared in 2013 and published in 2014. But we should also say that there are other organizations that have been working on this uh, over, the, over the years. So thank you for saying that we are the organization, but there are others as, as well. Uh, our approach to it is that we have to look at the problem from the perspective of why is it Armenian, Western Armenian under threat. And one of the fundamental issues there is that it is not being transferred to the next generation or it's not being transferred enough to the next generation. So we should put the focus on, on that transmission of Western Armenian from one generation to the next, and therefore we have to focus on the younger uh, folks, the younger kids, let's say, the, the teenagers, uh, young men and women, and try to make Western Armenian something that comes natural to them as much as possible within a diaspora condition. So that is our philosophy, and that's and one of the fundamental problems there is that there isn't enough um, human resources who are in tune with modern pedagogical means in order to teach and to enable students to acquire the language. So it's not the traditional way of teaching the language, but to also acquire the language. So we're trying to put the focus on the preparation of human resources to do this in modern contemporary ways. There are many issues with Western Armenian, you know, the spelling, uh, the, there are uh, some people talk about uh, the fact that the word Canada is spelled three different ways in Western Armenia. That's, that's a yes, uh, an example a lot of people use. Yes, to which I respond, so what? I say, so if Canada is written three different ways, is our problem that we need to standardize that among the diaspora, which is nearly impossible? Uh, or is our problem the fact that People who are, you know, from their, let's say, you know, two, three years old up to 18, 19 are no longer using Western Armenian in daily language. Where is your problem? Our problem is there. And if, you know, 10 people speak, uh, 10, uh, you know, 15 year olds speak Western Armenian, spell Canada in three different ways, quite frankly, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> Well, it would hardly be bother Canadians as well. I don't, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, but the whole, pro um, I know, what are the challenges? Because from my perspective, teaching or teaching Armenian is something else, but also creating the environment where that Armenian can be continuously used exactly. is another, because that's the initial problem to begin with, right? I mean, families no longer use it, and probably parents don't have good command of it to trans transfer this language. So is this something that is also within your scope of... Uh, you have put your finger on a fundamentally important issue, uh, problem. And that is, we languages usually are spoken uh, in an environment that is geographically specific. So in the Armenian case, Western Armenian case, Aleppo, Burj Hamoud, to some degree Los Angeles. Now, how do you create that kind of an environment in a diaspora condition when you don't have necessarily a geographically central community? We don't have models for this. It's very difficult to say we're going to follow this model or that model. For example, people use Ireland as an example, or Basque country as examples where language was, is being revitalized. But those are states or provinces that have mechanisms to which they do that. In the diaspora, we don't have that. So we have to think of ways where we can actually create that environment, at least uh, 
either on a weekly basis or on a daily basis, where kids are coming together or adults are coming together and they're living their life uh, in Armenian, at least for those hours. And that's how they're acquiring the language. Uh, a teacher is not hitting them over the head and saying, you know, the whole, the whole things that we all went through. Um, my colleague, Ani Garmiyan, who works on this, she always says, opening up to the world in Armenian. And I think that's, that's the key to it. And I think we can create those spaces with innovative teaching within schools, where if the schools are willing to change and innovate, within uh, outside of school environments, uh, like the Magnet Group in Paris succeeded in doing to, to a large degree, and prepared a whole generation of French-born uh, Armenians who, who function in Western Armenian very comfortably and actually create music and, and poetry and things like that. So we have small examples like that. Our challenge is how to make this into a diaspora-wide movement, at least in the Western diaspora, the post-genocide established diaspora. And so that's what we're working on. Uh, we're working on preparing people, we're working on preparing tools, uh, we're working on uh, music, uh, using comedy, for example, to learn Armenian. These are the ways we have to adapt to you know, 21st century diaspora conditions. Well, uh, going back to preservation versus reinvigoration, and this is something that's bothered me, or at least I've thought about for a long time. How do you recreate something that I can't even translate, the Lezva Madazelaget? Do you have a translation for this? Well, the Western Armenian comes with a certain way of thinking yeah. that is dictated by the language. However, te learning it anew within an environment that doesn't yes. dictate this kind of... Is this something that we can recreate? Because a, this, is, this could go into reinvigoration, however, this couldn't there possibly many, be preserved. There are many levels to your question. There's the linguistic level, but there is also the subconscious cultural level as well. Um, I categorically reject uh, the statement that Armenians are the same everywhere. They're not. Armenians are very different, uh, w even within the same country. And each community, influenced by their host society, has a different approach to the world, a different mentality. Um, a Western Armenian diasporan, I think, in their Madazilagev, in their way of thinking, could be Western Armenian diaspora, but not necessarily in the Armenian language. And I really see this when we bring groups of uh, you know, teenagers and uh, young people together in one room. You really can see that uh, the commonalities between the French Armenians, the American Armenians, and the Bolsahai Armenians uh, are a lot greater than Lebanon, uh, Lebanon Armenians with French Armenians, even though they might be speaking Western Armenian. So you really see that when you, you work with this. Of course, we can say Armenians are the same everywhere, one, you know, megas, mega everything, but that's not going to solve your problems. That's propaganda, that's a statement that, you know, officials have to make and they make. But if you're going to solve a problem, you have to look at what are the pedagogy, pedagogic needs of each community and sometimes of each city. And in that, you really can capture you know, uh, the respect for the Armenian culture and Armenian language. And if someone doesn't speak Armenian, so be it. I'm not going to say you're not a good Armenian. You're Armenian, fine. Perhaps one day they will say, okay, I'm going to learn better Armenian, perhaps not. But that, that responsibility towards the Armenian culture is often there. It's almost always there. That's what we find being Armenian. How about the relation of the Republic of Armenia to the Western Armenian? Ah, that's Madet Verkim Vrateri, as they say in Armenian. You, you, you put your finger on a, a difficult topic. Um, the government, NGOs, uh, the university, the academy all say Western Armenian is important. Uh, and that's great, the fact that they actually say that. Uh, but with all due respect, I don't think they understand Western Armenian mentality. I don't think they understand the established diaspora. Uh, the established diaspora is very complicated in, this, in its psychology, in its collective psychology, how it relates to Armenia. And there are many ways. Some come to Armenia, love it, and this is the homeland. Some come to Armenia, they don't love it, but they feel responsible towards Armenia. And others say, I don't care about Armenia, my culture and my ancestry is important. Uh, all of that is, to me, it's fine. Uh, but coming back to your question, I think the greatest thing that the Republic could do, all institutions, uh, uh, 
be it NGOs, uh, academic or government, is to actually respect Western Armenia, to actually show respect towards the language and to consider it as a legitimate branch of the Armenian language, not a parpars, not a dialect, not ancient Armenian, and to actually, you know, if they can do some work to educate Armenians in Armenia about, you know, the richness of Western Armenian culture, the duality that we have, Eastern Armenian and Western Armenian, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, to expect them to be the best teachers of Western Armenian, no, this is, you know, the, the Republic is in Eastern Armenia, let's not be naive about that. But to actually support, to actually not support, but to actually respect that Western Armenian and respect the divergent ways of being Armenian uh, around the world and divergent ways of really dealing with the Republic. So there needs to be some kind of work done, done towards this end. Uh, well, because so. like <laughs> sliding to your to to the next question, I had like the Gulbenkian Foundation, the Armenian Communities Department, also works on the normalization of Armenian-Turkish relations. Yes. Uh, how does this come in into the scope of preservation of the or reinvigoration of the Armenian language? And and this and since July, since this year, especially given understanding the divide between the diaspora and the Armenia, that we now stand at a point where we see it's greater than we ever imagined it was. Uh, do you think there could be a change of policy or a little bit more effort in bringing this, this communication between the diaspora and the Armenia? I think you're asking three different questions uh, in there. Uh, one about I thought the it was four. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, one, the summer, uh, the summer events and uh, things like that. Yes, it was a wake-up call for many diasporans uh, that things are not all rosy in Armenia and there are fundamental problems that they need to be addressed. Uh, it surprised me to some degree that it came as a surprise because, uh, but and the, and the Sasnat Zaver thing actually was a shock to people and as was the, as was the four-day war uh, in early April. So um, I think diasporans started asking more fundamental questions. And, and I think they should ask those fundamental questions. If, if they're sending money here, if diasporans are sending money here, I think they have the right to ask questions. Um, so that's, I think, one, one uh, issue. And I think a lot depends on what happens uh, in the parliamentary elections that are coming up in April, May, I think it, it is. And I think that's going to be a very important point for diasporans because now they're focusing more on Armenian politics. There is this trend in the diaspora, do charitable work, send money, invest, don't get involved in politics, don't ask questions in politics. And I think after 25 years, many diasporans are realizing that you cannot separate the two and you have to ask questions about, about politics. Well, probably it's not even politics, probably it's issues like civil society exactly. and uh, human rights. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're asking those questions, which, which is good. They should ask those questions. Uh, and I think... Uh, Leaders here are also realizing the Haive Nasi uh, the idea of supporting the homeland and all that, can only go so far in terms of linking diasporans to here. We'll see what happens in the next few months, but it could go in the di direction that there could be greater and greater schism between the diaspora and, and uh, Armenia. And that depends a lot on internal politics here. Now, the second uh, question that you asked about Armenian-Turkish relations and our work in that, that's a whole very different type of uh, issues. Uh, it is to enhance programs or to support programs that show our common history uh, before the genocide, to talk about the genocide openly uh, in Turkey, which is happening more and more as well. Um, and also, in my view, uh, I didn't mention Bolis, Istanbul. Uh, Istanbul is a wealth of culture, wealth of language when it comes to Western Armenia. And depending again the way things uh, work out or pan out in Turkey, I think in the next 20, 30, 40 years, we can again make uh, Istanbul a hub, a center of Western Armenian culture writing, uh, cultural production. But again, it depends on, in this case, Turkish internal politics, of course. Uh, and so Gülbengian, Kadus Gülbengian himself being from Istanbul, uh, Gülbengian is actually interested in this and it, it works uh, at two levels in, in Turkey. One at the level of dialogue between you know, Turks, Kurds, Armenians, and at the level of enhancing Western Armenian and enhancing Bolis as a center of Western Armenia. Dr. Pansian, going back to 
to the prior question that we uh, discussed about Armenia, uh, probably relations Armenia with the Western Armenia. Do you think, and I know this is what not this is not in your program, but mm -hmm. do you think on a legislative level we, uh, we could work on it, like petition for Western Armenian to be recognized as a second official language constitutionally? Or, well, uh, I mean, there are, there are countries that have uh, several languages yes. as recognized as their official language. Um, the, the constitution of the Republic of Armenia does not say Eastern or Western Armenian. It says Armenian is the official language of the Republic. So I don't think the minority language model works because it's not a minority language. Uh, it's one branch of vernacular Armenian. Um, it's a very good question to ask, I think, when you have a guest uh, who works in Armenia, who is an academic, why is that, that taking place? The Ministry of Diaspora's uh, web page, uh, website is in Western Armenian as well, as far as I, I remember, it's Eastern, Western, Russian, uh, English. Simple things like why can't the Ministry of Justice website also be in Western Armenia. Uh, it takes a bit of resources, but it's not that difficult to do. Um, well, you if, know, if there was a parallel effort in this direction, would it help your program? Of course it would help the program. It will, it will make Western Armenian, uh, as I said before, a legitimate uh, language in which someone could communicate in this, uh, in this country. It, symbolically, it's huge. Even though 1% or 2% might use it, but symbolically, it's huge. Uh, I'm Canadian. In the Canadian context, federal government is bilingual. So even if there's not a single francophone in a city in Alberta, let's say, the one francophone has the right to a trial in French. Now, we're talking two distinct languages. We're not talking, you know, the two branches of the same language. Uh, of course, it's, but that's symbolically very important for the identity of Canada as a bilingual country. And I think there are ways of doing that here in the Republic. Uh, it's a question you should be asking, you know, someone from the from the government or someone from the academy. Well, the now I can at least tell them that uh, Dr. Panosian thinks it would be helpful for <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I never give myself any right to tell anyone what to do. You know, I represent the Gilbengian Foundation. I, you know, I focus on my, what I do, but I'm not. I don't represent the diaspora. I don't represent anything. I represent one organization. That's it. Well, um, your program started a couple of years ago and it's almost nearing its end because you had set a five year. Uh, yes. So if you evaluate it and for the next five years, what do you have planned? Uh, also, of course, my questions are never one question. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, with the uh, Armenians in 2115 program, which is also a strategic right. uh, extension of right. uh, preparing for the future this future as seen by right. the Galos Bimekian Foundation, what does it envisage? Right. Um, the 2115, uh, this is a report uh, that we put out uh, based on a conference that we had organized, a seminar, a closed seminar we had organized in Lisbon with the leadership of the Armenian diaspora, mostly mm -hmm. the Armenian diaspora, and uh, we provocatively called it uh, Armenians in 2115, not in 2015, and actually a number of people pointed out a typo in the title, <laughs> so we said, no, it's not a typo. Uh, and we laid out certain strategic directions, which was, let's say, the common wisdom of the leadership of the diaspora as much as it exists. It wasn't our programming plan. It's not that something we're going to do. It talks about Nagorno-Karabakh, I mean, Azerbaijan relations. It talks about you know, the identity issues, all sorts of things. This captured what is the, as I said, the consensus in terms of where Armenia is going and what are the questions ought to be asked. Uh, it was very innovative insofar as it was the first time that these men and women were brought together and to thinking 100 discuss. years ahead. And thinking ahead, yeah. 100 years is too long. As I said, that was the provocative title, but you know, thinking 20, 30 years ahead. For example, um, you know, if Nagorno-Karabakh uh, continues this way, uh, what's going to happen? If it continues that way, what's going to happen? Mind you, this was before the April War. And interestingly, people said that the risk of a, you know, accidental war is high, uh, although the war was not accidental, we know that. But in any case, so that's a 2115 report. It's out there in Eastern Armenian and uh, in uh, English. People could look at it, but please, this is not our programming plan. Don't ask us what we're doing you know, on this domain or that domain because, um, you know, we focus on one domain, education culture. 
this, uh, the second uh, component of your uh, question about our own five-year programming plan, we're, uh, we started in 2014, it ends at the end of 2018. Uh, you should ask me that question regarding the next uh, uh, phase in 2017, because in 2017 we're going to have an internal discussion at first, uh, then we will have a discussion uh, with the diaspora in, in, in Armenia regarding what should be the next phase of Gitbengian. Uh, one of the things that emerged out of the 2115 report was the need to have, I don't want to use the word think tank because it doesn't capture uh, the essence of that, the need to have a neutral space within the diaspora where people come and can you know, do research or support research and talk about national issues, yeah. pan-national issues, Hamaska in Hatsir. And a lot of people looked at Birbengen as the only institution that could do that because it's completely neutral, it's above community politics, it has its own funding. Uh, and so the, it's an int intriguing idea for us. It implies a fundamental shift in what we do or important shift in what we do, maybe we can do a hybrid thing because we are, we are essentially a donating body. We, we give grants, we give uh, scholarships. And so that's one thing that has been floated as a possibility. But again, this discussion hasn't taken place. We're going to start thinking about what to do next. I'm pretty sure the revitalization of Western Armenia will remain at the heart of our thing. Um, we have to think about the scholarships, what we do with our scholarships, um, uh, with our you know, support. Well, so, I, I said it was my last question, but uh, <laughs> one please. more, probably a short one. Are there enough scholars? working in the domain? Do you have a shortage of scholars who concentrate in Armenian studies or an in interest, have interest in Armenian studies? I was flabbergasted that we had 74 applications, 74, 75 something applications in Armenian studies for PhD, masters and PhD. Uh, I did not expect to get that, that many applications. So there are a lot of people doing Armenian studies and there is a lot of interest. On the other hand, we have a scholarship category saying that uh, anyone who wants to be an Armenian language teacher will give a scholarship. And in the last three years, we have received one applicant. So in that domain, there hasn't been that much interest. Uh, but you know, we're trying to do other things to encourage, the, uh, as I said, the human resource preparation. So uh, we received uh, 700 some odd scholarship applications and we have different categories of applications uh, every year. It's on our website and every year we publish who we give the scholarship to uh, and things like that. Uh, we just put the 2015 report on our website. Thank you very much and uh, good luck with, <laughs> with your imp important mission and uh, we thank the viewers as well for, for joining us. I hope you found the, the conversation interesting.